Chef Nikki Egan. Hi everyone, thanks for being here so early on a Saturday morning. We really appreciate it. I'm Nikki Egan, um, in case you couldn't figure that out. And, <laughs> this is Denise and Aaron, and we wrote the book um, Victim F together, and it's out Tuesday, but we have copies here. There'll be a meet and greet afterward with a signing, so if you're interested, you can buy one afterward and we'll sign it. But um, we're hoping to just sort of introduce you to what happened that night and who Denise and Aaron are. And um, we will open it up to questions from the audience um, after we sort of go through our, our talk. So um, I just wanted to have Denise and Aaron. So Denise, tell me, tell me how you ended up in Vallejo. Like, what were you doing for a profession? Oh, sorry, we're going to do Aaron first. Aaron, how did you end up in Vallejo, and when did you move there? And what were you doing for a living? Yeah, so I'm a physical therapist. We're actually both physical therapists. And, uh, I ended up in Vallejo because there's a postgraduate residency program there, and uh, it works with a, a neurological rehab. So people have suffered strokes, brain injuries, or spinal cord injuries primarily is uh, the, the patient population we worked with. And I was fortunate enough to do this residency that is, um, gets therapists from around the world to, to train there. Uh, and after I finished the program, uh, I was able to be hired on as staff, and so I that's, ended up staying in Vallejo. And that's why I purchased a house on Mare Island, which is part of the city of Vallejo. And, um, I was, so I started working there in 2010, uh, and then Denise came in 2014. Mm -hmm. Right, so I, um, I moved to Vallejo in June 2014 for this nine-month physical therapy residency. I'd worked for a couple of years um, after I graduated with a doctorate in physical therapy. Um, and that's where we met, um, we were colleagues, and um, I, we were initially drawn together um, by our shared passion and love for physical therapy. Um, and we ended up talking a lot at, um, at social gatherings, and quickly um, there was just an instant connection, and we started hanging out more. And, <laughs> developed a relationship and fell in love. But, you know, Andrew, um, sorry. <laughs> Aaron had just, uh, he was sort of in a breakup period with his, had broken up with his ex-fiance, but she, but they were still living in the same house in different rooms. So that was like, he was falling in love with you, but he still wasn't done with that. So I know for the next few months it was back and forth, but you guys, you know, were back together the night of March 22nd, 2015, and, and things we're good. I mean, Aaron has t talked about how he fell in love. He knew he was in love with you. It was just hard unraveling himself from this other relationship. So, um, so you came over there that night, and do you want to, and you, you talked, you reconciled, and then tell us what happened at 3 a.m. Yeah, I mean, we, we had an emotional talk because we were at a crossroads in a relationship. Um, like Nikki was saying, you know, Aaron was um, having some difficulties really detaching from that, that former relationship. Um, uh, but that night was definitely a turning point and we, we got to a really good place. It was an emotional evening um, and we went to bed around midnight um, and just fell into a deep sleep. Um, and the next thing I know, I'm, I'm hearing this unknown man's voice, uh, just kind of relentlessly repeating phrases over and over. And at first, I, I just felt like uh, I was in a nightmare, and I wanted to wake up from it, but my body wasn't letting me wake up, because I think my subconscious knew the reality of the situation. Um, and eventually, my eyes shot open, and I just froze uh, and saw this flashing white light um, on the wall, and just multiple red laser dots crossing the wall and they disappear as they crossed over our bodies and this voice said, um, wake up, this is a robbery, we're not here to hurt you. And instantly I knew, I mean, we were surrounded, there was people there um, with guns facing us. Um, and, you know, the next thing I know, he's just telling me um, that I'm gonna tie up Aaron He's going to drop zip ties at the end of the bed, um, and Aaron's going to have his 
tie, I was going to tie Aaron's hands behind his back, his feet together, um, and then told me to go to the closet where I was then bound and blindfolded with those blacked out swim goggles. Um, he helped Aaron hop over to the closet where he was blindfolded, and then we were given recordings with pre, um, this pre-recorded instructions with this really odd, like wind chime-like music, so it was soothing, but in just the most um, terrifying situation. Um, and each step of, of, uh, of the evening or each moment, it just realized, I just realized that it, how planned this was. I mean, this wasn't just some random break-in. Um, before he had me tie up Aaron, he said Aaron's name. Um, and so it just, it just felt like something out of just an awful movie. Um, and initially in the recordings, they said that, again, it was going to be a robbery. We were given a sedative, and we could hear people downstairs um, from opposite ends of the house um, while this man who spoke was with us. And it first thought, OK, it's just going to be a robbery. Um, they're going to clear stuff out, and we'll be drugged, and in the morning we'll somehow wake up, and we'll be fine. But I was then moved um, eventually downstairs when uh, this man came down and said, we have a problem. This wasn't meant for you. This was meant for, and he named Aaron's ex fiance by her first and last name. And uh, I mean, I couldn't imagine why this happened or was designed for anyone and had hoped maybe they would just leave, but he then told me that they would take me for 48 hours and uh, I'd be held and Aaron would have to complete some tasks and um, eventually I was put in Aaron's trunk and driven for a little, um, maybe 20 minutes or so and transferred to another trunk and then um, held at a location hours away for the next 48 hours um, where I was continuously drugged and then raped twice. Yes, um, and then Aaron talk about like, we went you two were separated, what was going on with you because you were also given very specific instructions for the kidnapping and your, they said they'd be watching you. They said they had surveillance software on their phones. Um, they, they heard drilling when they were upstairs and the kidnappers had installed a camera up in the corner of Aaron's living room and they said they would be monitoring what he did to make sure that he didn't call police, but he, he had a decision to make about whether or not to do that once, once you woke up from, you know, after the, being drugged. Yeah, so, so during that time, uh, Denise and I were separated in my house. Uh, the kidnappers gave me a long instructions um, through recorded messages. Uh, the kidnapper also asked me if uh, my ex and Denise looked alike, which I said, yes, they both have long blonde hair. Um, and he, he repeated that it was intended for my ex fiance who um, would like to know that she was, had, was having an affair. That's why our relationship broke up. Just, uh, yeah. and, uh, and then they said they were going to, they forced me to give up my social security number, my bank account numbers, all, like access to all my emails, uh, to my phone. And they were playing modern software on my phone. So if I called anyone, uh, they would hurt Denise. If I called the police, they would kill Denise. And they had installed a camera um, in my house, and they said they were going to make my home uh, my prison. And if I needed to stay within the camera's viewpoint, and if I left, they would hurt or kill Denise. And they put the, this red tape all over, like the downstairs mm -hmm. of his house. He wasn't supposed to go beyond it. And yes, that's an important point to make. Aaron and um, his ex-fiance had broken up because he found out she was cheating on him with a cop in a neighboring area. And um, we're not sure if that's all connected to this somehow, but we talk about it in the book because there's a lot of unanswered questions about why she was targeted. But they had been surveilling Aaron for months unbeknownst to him. Um, these pre then these recordings had his ex-fiance's name in it. And so it was like Aaron and, we don't say her name for obviously legal reasons, but um, they used a drone to spy on them. Um, the, the one kidnapper who had Denise tells them that that's just a week prior, they had been at the door to his master bedroom and were going to enter the room, but there were police on the island, so they backed away. But this was all, they had been 
uh, Aaron's um, security system. Talk a little bit about that, some of the, the things you've been noticing but you didn't really put together till later. Yeah, about, probably about six months before the actual home invasion, I, uh, my security system started kind of acting up and it would, went set or would go off and then uh, I would call and I kept on trying to troubleshoot it and nothing seemed to change but the security system wasn't working. I actually even tried to set it that night and kept on repeating that when it actually set. Uh, and even the week before I was getting, uh, I was having this feeling of like paranoia. I actually had told my mom, I was like, I think someone's watching me uh, because I kept on catching this like glare. Uh, my, uh, I'll back up. My house has uh, open space behind it and I was catching this glare almost like from a lens or a watch up on a hill that would be able to, if you had put a camera, you could view down into my house. And I just kind of blew that off a little bit, um, or rationalized that, why would anybody be watching a, a 30-year-old who lives by himself? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm not that interesting. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and even the months leading up to, I would come home from work and I would feel like something had moved to my house or someone had been in there, it felt disturbed, but I would go through and there was nothing missing. I, and I'm like, but I had this feeling like someone's been in here. And then again, I just would rationalize that way. And then when the home invasion happened, I woke up, I was like, every paranoia thing was justified. Uh, so the kidnappers had created this constraints to me, like I can't call because they can see what I'm, my phone, like I can't get out of the camera's view. Uh, but as the kidnappers had brought us, or one of the kidnappers brought me down to my living area where I, I needed to stay for 48 hours, uh, the camera that was installed was making this like dung, like this electric yeah. dung, dung, dung sound. And I, remember I asked him, I'm like, is it going to do that the entire time? Because I just realized, like, right when I heard it, I was like, that will drive me insane. If I have to listen to this for the next 48 hours, I'm already at like my wit's end. And he uh, told me that they weren't able to access my router, so they had to upload it through the Wi-Fi, and it should be loaded by the morning and stop that sound. So I had, uh, yeah, not the best move. Um, I had, the, they had given us sedative, so when they took Denise, um, I tried to stay awake, and I couldn't. I just, the sedatives took over, and I passed out, and I ended up uh, eventually being able to stay awake until about 11. It took me about 11.30 to where I could actually have my eyes stay open. And then I started receiving text messages and emails from the kidnappers giving me instructions for payment. Uh, but that camera still made the dung, dung, dung sound. Uh, and at that point, after a few exchanges, uh, the kidnappers said they were gonna, I would pay the money, they would, I would pay the money Tuesday night, they would give Denise back Wednesday morning. And then they're, and I, started thinking like, how can I trust these guys? If I show up with the money, these don't take both of us and, and kill us. Um, then there's no witnesses. And I, so I was trying to weigh my options. The camera kept on making that noise and I realized that they probably can't actually see me because uh, it's most likely not fully loaded at this point. And so I made a calculated risk to call my brother. Uh, and my brother is an FBI special agent. And he tells me that I need to call 911 because we need to get the full force of law enforcement to find Denise. And, uh, and I agreed with him. And uh, so I took the phone. I, I started, I put in 911. I had to, and right before I hit the call button, I just, uh, I remember thinking this is like, sorry. Um, it was the hardest decision in my life because I knew if the police came, I was going to be okay, but the, kidnap the kidnapper saw the call that they potentially would kill Denise. And I was, wasn't sure if I was just making the most selfish de decision because they were asking for an amount of money that I could pay. And obviously I would pay any amount to get her back, uh, but they, had, they asked for an amount that I could easily access. So for me, it's like, why, why am I doing this if I can? But again, you can't trust people who break into your home plan like this and maybe everything they're the kind of gentleman way of the um, they're doing this home evasion maybe it's just a ploy to subdue us and then attack uh, so I called 911 
the cops came and their first question, or one of their first questions were, are you on drugs? And I said, yes, the kidnappers drugged me. And then they repeatedly asked, have you been partying? And I said, no. And, they're like, and they kept on asking, and everything was more just accusatory to me uh, and not really any questions about actually what happened. Uh, eventually, they kind of softened. I go to the police station to give a, a statement. Way back. Yeah. But one of the first things they did, right, was they went up oh, yeah. to tell them about the camera, what they did to them. So this they is walk one in. of the first things the cops did when they show up. They walk into, they clear upstairs, they walk into the living room, that dung, dung, dung sounds going, and, and one of the cops walks over and just unplugs the camera. And I was just horrified, because I assume they're, they can't see me, but they could probably see that the camera's still loading, and they just unplugged it, even, they didn't wear gloves. Um, and he told them the kidnappers had left this, this camera to monitor him. Yeah. To me, that was like the first sign that they did not believe him, even though you know, they had no reason not to. Um, and Denise, meanwhile, tell, tell me, um, so, and the kidnappers were wearing wetsuits. I mean, this is how well planned it was, and they figured it was because, they, you know, so they wouldn't leave DNA behind, or if they had to escape off the island. But then the voice, as we call him in the first part of the book, because of course we don't know, he's one of the kidnappers, he's the one who took Denise. He tells Denise about their group um, and what they were doing, and can you talk a little bit about this group that he's a part of? Yeah, so when I was um, held in captivity, he, would explain to me um, why they were doing this. So he said that it was like a, a black mar market startup company that they developed um, to, that a, a client can hire them to fulfill either personal or financial debts. Um, and so then they were hired to do this. Um, and they're all highly trained. Um, he said he was in the military. They have technological background. They've even studied the psychological effects of victims and crimes like this to try to know what to expect. Um, and they've done this before. Um, and I mean, he said that he didn't know why they were hired. They didn't know who hired him because he was going to be in charge of watching over the captive. It helps eliminate the possibility that he would give something away of of who hired them. Um, and so, I mean, it all was, again, just very structured, very planned out. It seemed like they had done this before. Um, and again, just made it all the more evident that I was completely def defenseless. I mean, to, to drug us immediately, to have knee tie air, knee tie Aaron up, um, so, and not even come close enough to the male victim to even allow for a, a defense. Um, you know, I was just, I was, I had, I had really no, my only defense at that time, especially in captivity, uh, was to try to befriend him and build a rapport and show him who I was as a person and hope that maybe he'd follow through with releasing me and not kill me. I mean, it's, um, you know, you can only imagine what something like this would be like. You hear about it in the movies, and you just don't think that it's actually going to happen. Um, and so I, I mean, I, I just used whatever, whatever defense that I had. And um, even with the rapes, I, he told me it was going to happen. He didn't, he said that um, it needed to happen because since this wasn't meant for me, they didn't have any information on me, so he was going to record the rape um, to use in case they thought that I would talk to the police and then they'd release it on the internet. Um, and with the first rape, I was still had those blacked out swim goggles on and I was thinking this isn't, I mean, this, is, this, doesn't, this isn't going to look like anything other than someone being raped. And, because um, he initially said it, it should look like somewhat consensual, um, like we were having an affair or something. And so then the second rape the next day, he said it wasn't good enough and he was going to tape my eyes shut so it just looks like my eyes are closed and that I would have to perform um, to kiss and say things to make it seem like we were actually in a relationship. Okay, you don't have to. No, it's fine. Okay. 
And what, tell him what they said, um, tell him what he said about his ex fiance because he was trying to figure out who, about who may have hired them and why. The little conversation you had with The Voice about that. Well, he asked me if I knew anything about her, and I knew a lot from, from what Aaron told me, but she also worked at the hospital with us, so I knew a little bit about her. Um, and he asked if anyone in her family had money, and I had mentioned I, from Aaron that um, uh, I think her ex-husband's family had money, and he kind of dismissed that, and it's like the only other thing I know is the affair that she had with this cop, and um, and he kind of stopped and paused and was like, well, that sounds like that might be it, but there was nothing definitive, and of course at that moment too, I'm thinking, you know, I mean, not only is this an organized group, there's potentially someone in law enforcement involved in this, um, and so that made it, <laughs> Again, even more terrifying, you know, so even if I do get released, if I do speak to police, are they going to know what I tell them? Because someone on the inside might be involved, too. And they said they monitor, they didn't tell you they monitor people for years after or months Yeah, he gave an example of a prior victim, uh, seemed like she was going to go speak to the police, and they delivered a pie on the doorstep of her mom, who lived across the country as a a threat just to say, like, we're still watching. So all this is going on, and Aaron goes to the police for help, and then quickly discovers what, that you're the suspect, yeah. right? So I go to the police to give a statement and try to help anything I could do to, to help them find Denise. Um, one of the first things they do is take my DNA, and they take the clothes I'm wearing, um, literally strip me down naked, take pictures um, for evidence. Um, and they give me prison clothes to wear during this. Uh, and then I'm stuck in this small room with uh, no clock, uh, no window. Uh, I'm just locked in the interrogation room. And for the next 18 hours, they aggressively interrogate me uh, and say, this didn't happen. We don't believe you. Uh, something bad happened. but." Uh, this frogman, no frogman came into your house and you killed Denise and you can either admit to it now or, and say it's an accident or we'll, if you keep denying we're going to paint you as a cold calculated murderer. And this is like pretty standard operating procedure for police. There was no, there was no you did, the, maybe the kidnapping happened, we'll investigate that. It was just you killed her and your only choices are accident or your you're a sociopath. And I got questioned not all hours of the night, one in the morning, three in the morning. Uh, eventually I asked for my brother. I, but then tell me about the lie detector, the FBI, yeah. then the FBI gets so, involved. Yeah, multiple times I asked for my brother because he said he was going to be at the station. They, they tell me they don't know where he is, uh, which was untrue. He's saying, he's, my parents and him stayed in the station the entire time. They just lied to me and said that he wasn't there. Uh, they asked me to take a polygraph, and uh, I think if I wasn't so tired and so terrified, I would have denied that. Um, and but I agreed to do it, thinking foolishly that it would clear, my, clear me as a suspect. Um, little did I know it didn't matter what the polygraph said, and not that polygraphs are reliable in the first place, uh, they were just going to use it as a tool to say um, that I failed, and which they did. The FBI agent said, without doubt, you failed it miserably. Um, there's no question, you know where Denise is, there's no question in my mind that you killed her. Uh, later we find out they never even evaluated the polygraph. Uh, they said results unknown in their affidavit. And you've never seen them, and your I lawyers never, never saw them. No one ever saw it, because it didn't matter. It was. Uh, at that point, point, after I supposedly failed this polygraph, uh, the FBI agent goes after me for about 45 minutes nonstop. I mean, if it wasn't so ridiculous, it was kind of impressive, because he barely even stopped to take a breath. Um, at one point I asked, I'm like, what evidence do you guys have that I did anything? And he couldn't come up with that. 
that would stump them that there might, you might actually need evidence to prove someone's guilty. Um, at the same time, when outside, they're telling my brother that they could charge me with murder without a body. Uh, and I, so I asked for a lawyer 15 hours in uh, because I had been telling them the same thing and they just they wouldn't, they wouldn't stop. And I just needed it to stop somehow. And he keeps cooperating because he needs them to find Denise. He knew yeah. the kidnappers were going to be in touch again. They said they'd call. They said they were going to email. And he needs them, their cooperation. And that's why he, another reason, he kept trying to convince them that and to do something. And he was cooperating. If you've never been in that room, the power dynamics are, are so skewed. You're, you think, I mean, I was raised, if you're in trouble, call the police. And now I realize like, they made everything worse. Um, and I'm centered, trying to defend myself, but again, like, I have to, I need their help because they're the only ones who are going to potentially save Denise. Uh, yeah, watching the interrogations, you know, years later and seeing what they said, I'm not looking for a live Denise, I'm looking for a dead Denise. She's dead, all right? I've accepted it, you accept it, she's dead. And at that time, I mean, it's, I think one of the kidnappers was trying to call and no one was monitoring his phone. And just seeing that strategy, being the person who was missing, realizing like it wasn't really me that they cared about finding, it just seemed like they cared about being right. And that was really hard to, to swallow. Yeah, that 2020 aired a two-hour episode on the case last night, and you can see the inter some of the interrogation videos on there, and there are other ex excerpts elsewhere. I know when I, I first watched it, when we were working on the book, I, it, was, it was hard to watch. It's so awful to, to I know Aaron now and who he is, and he's such a good person, and to think that he was treated this way is, is what chance does the average person have in that town if, you know, you have two people who have never done anything to bring anything upon themselves, and it didn't matter. They decided, oh, there's a guy here, his girlfriend's missing, he killed her. But then what happens is they get a proof of life audio. Denise's kidnapper has her record an audio of a proof of life. Mm -hmm. and, and then the police sort of, so do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, I mean, just from the bigger picture of that, you know, they go from Aaron murdered me, and we were in this horrible fight. Um, and, you know, I was jealous or whatever, and then Aaron must have, it must have been an accident, he didn't mean to, but he murdered me. And then a proof of life is sent to indicate that I'm not dead, and so they immediately go to this whole gone girl, it's a hoax thing. And that's, uh, and that's clear when I talked to my family, you know, months later, my mom and brother came up to listen to that proof of life, and um, all they did was ask them questions that would paint me in a negative light and, um, and even told my family, you should watch Gone Girl, this will explain a lot. And this is before I'm released. Um, and I'm still at the hands and the mercy of these terrorists. And I could have easily still been killed. Um, but it just shows how quick they went from well, Aaron still must be shady. You know, we couldn't be wrong that, that we thought that he killed her. So then they, they must be in on it together, and it must be a hoax. And the police had put Aaron's phone on airplane mode. Yeah, so that, the proof of life, all this happened Sunday night into Monday morning was a home invasion. Uh, the proof of life came out Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday evening, they asked me to come to verify that's Denise's voice almost Oh, they played me the proof of life about 10 hours after they actually had received it. Uh, then they give me my phone. Uh, actually, they give me my, yes, they give me my phone, and my, uh, my lawyer's paralegal sees that it's on airplane mode. And I ask, ask them, should I take it off? And I do, and it did, my, my phone just floods with messages. Uh, then they ask me to open up my emails, and I see that there's emails that have been opened um, from the kidnappers. So the cops had looked at them because I gave them access to it. And they said they were going to call around 9 p.m. that night. And my phone was on airplane mode the entire time. Later we find out they did call around that time. 
three, they called three times in about five minutes. They tracked those phone calls over 24 hours later. Uh, and it brought them up to South Lake Tahoe. It triangulated to South Lake Tahoe, which the police never went up there. And at. even after I was released, they never went up there. And then later when one of the perpetrators was caught, he was caught in South Lake Tahoe. And when, Mar you know, when Aaron's being interrogated by Detective Mustard, that's, that's really his name. Yeah. <laughs> we do have and a joke, Colonel Mustard. Special yeah. Agent French, yeah. too. And, French. Um, sorry, the name is just, but uh, Mustard actually tells Aaron that they've not heard from the kidnappers. They've not, he flat out lies to him um, and tells him, no, they haven't heard anything from him because, of course, you know, you're the killer, so they're not even trying. I mean, it, there's just so many levels of this, it's hard to fathom all the terrible things they did, but Denise is released 48 hours later. They, the kidnapper says he can't take her to Vallejo because there's all this media coverage, because now the media is everywhere, and it's like they had recovered Aaron's car but didn't bother to tell his parents who were sitting in the police station that they found Aaron's car. And, um, and so the kidnapper says, well, do you want to say how you ended up in Huntington Beach? Well, I mean, he asked me where I live or if where family could get to me, um, and I said no one is in Northern California. Everyone's in Southern California, and he so he agreed that he would drop me off um, in my hometown, and uh, I told him where my mom lived. Um, it was on my driver's license, so I'm like, I mean, I can't lie to this person, um, and so we decided there was a. a a street that we could, I could easily walk to my mom's and even if she wasn't home I could walk to my dad's, he lived a mile away from her. Um, and so he said that that's what he was going to do and um, we were going to leave early in the morning um, and he followed through with it. Uh, I was heavily sedated for that, I think it's, it was probably about a nine hour drive. Um, and. I mean, I still was in disbelief the whole time, still thinking, like, he, he's, he's not actually going to do this. And, and really, like, I mean, every moment I was in captivity until that car drove away, um, I was just making peace with the end of my life. Um, but he did. Uh, he, he said, we are here, and he... Um, took me out of the car and he, they had taken my, my overnight bag that I had brought to Aaron's um, and my work bag and my glasses and my purse and so he uh, dropped that out of the car and told me to count to 10. Before he left though, he, he was sure to tell me that um, my strength was admirable and he really wishes that we could have met under different circumstances. Um, and you know, uh, what this did to someone is not what he got into this for, and so he's going to change, and he's this never going to happen again. And you know, I've like opened his eyes, and um, yeah. Uh, anyways, he tells me to count to ten. He the, I can hear the car drive off. Um, he had taped my eyes shut and put sunglasses um, over my eyes so it didn't look suspicious because I was allowed to um, ride in the front seat. Um, on the, the drive down. Um, but yeah, I peeled the tape off and I walked, stumbled down the alley and I saw the street name of, of where I grew up and I was like, I'm home. I mean, I, I, I was still so, in so much shock that I was actually free, but at the same time, I was still confined to their threats and didn't feel like I'd ever be free for the rest of my life because before also he released me, he'd said, you know, there's so much media coverage. Um, Aaron went to the police, so you're gonna have to talk to the police, which is fine. You can tell them everything about the organization and that it was meant for Aaron's ex and you can tell them everything I told you. Um, he said it would be good PR for their group uh, <laughs> because it shows that they can um, successfully complete this task without harming you know, uh, the victim. Um, uh, but he said, you know, when you do talk to them, you can't tell them anything about us, us having sex or um, anything about any of us being in the military. And if you do, um, I know where your family lives. You know, we, we're always watching you. 
So that was just hanging over me as I stumbled to try to find my mom. She wasn't home. I, I tried, I used someone's phone to try to call both my mom and dad, went to voicemail. I let my dad know the route that I was going because I didn't have a phone. Um, and uh, once I got to his house, a neighbor was outside and, and took me in and almost immediately two officers um, from Huntings Beach came in um, and uh, started questioning me and overall initially I and mean, they were respectful um, but there was little things along the way that that kind of caught me off guard um, a few minutes in I could see he was standing and holding a recording device discreetly by his side um, and that worried me and throughout that whole uh, conversation it was about an hour and a half I spoke to Huntington Beach police um, I let them know like I, I, I was worried about what was going to come out in the press, um, and the officer asked, well, why are you, are you think this is going to happen to you again? And I said, yes. They said that if I talk too much, yes. And they said, you know, they told you not to say, like, talk to us. And I was like, I can't say too much. Um, and he did ask me if I was sexually assaulted, and I said no. Um, and I deflected and said, you know, overall, they treated me really nicely, even though being kidnapped and held against my will isn't anywhere nice, but you know they fed me and gave me water. And I mean, I think too at the time I had to. I was obviously afraid for my life and my family's life, um, thinking that this is going to get out um, eventually in the media. I mean, it, it, it happens, and they were trying to assure me, oh no, it'll all be blacked out if they get the request it anyways. But how do I know? And then again, how do I know that someone in the group's not? in the police, you know, and that's how they would find out information. Um, so, I mean, it was just a really, a really conflicting and like impossible position to be in. Um, and again, minute might have been it, like they're saying CSI will come in, a detective will come in and talk to you, and it just kept going on and on. I wasn't allowed to talk to my family. Um, I asked many times, can I talk to them? No, not yet. I'm sure they're really happy that you're, you're safe. And um, eventually my cousin comes in because he's an attorney. Um, so they couldn't hold him off any longer. Um, and for the first time, my cousin comes in and asks me, what do you want to do? What do you need? And I said, I just need to go somewhere safe. Um, and so I went to my aunt's house nearby, and the whole time we were in contact with the Vallejo police um, detective. Before we left that neighbor's house, uh, that detective mustard who questioned him got on the phone with my cousin and said, um, look, we're gonna be offering her immunity, a proffer of agreement. Uh, we're gonna be offering it to Aaron or to her, and uh, whoever accepts it first will get it. And Aaron's sitting across from me right now, so like, you have to be quick about this decision. And my response was immunity from what? Like what, what, what did I do? And then we spoke to family members in Vallejo and it was really obvious that they didn't believe me. And so obviously it, being offered, um, you know, this legal offer. And so I needed to consult with a criminal defense attorney. And that's how I got in contact with um, with my criminal defense attorney. Um, I spent all night telling him everything that happened, including the rapes, and he said, if you have to do, you have, you can choose not to speak to police, but if you do, you, you definitely have to tell them that you were raped, and I made that really impossible decision. Again, I just felt like um, if I did, I would be killing a family member trying to prove my innocence, because at the time, well, also, that press release came out. Right, so Denise um, was, really, I think he got in about what, 10 or 11 a.m. on mm -hmm. Wednesday, she's released, Aaron hears about it, he's excited, and then the police hold one press conference at around 3 p.m. and Aaron decides to watch it, thinking, okay, now the tone of this will change, Denise has been released. And instead they say, from an investigative standpoint, nothing has changed, even though Denise has been released. And then at 9.30 that night, they hold what became this infamous press conference, and Aaron watched it with his parents. So tell me like, what you remember about, this is where they called the whole thing a hoax. Yeah, so prior to that, I had been to police station. Um, they did the same thing, offered me uh, immunity, uh, 
they said they also had, uh, cl they had some sort of evidence that proved that uh, I was guilty of this hoax, which ended up being another lie. Uh, so the press conference starts, and uh, Lieutenant Kenny Park basically starts off with that we're no longer going to refer to him as victims, or uh, we're, he basically just says we're suspects, and that we, they couldn't substantiate anything I had said over the last 20, 48 hours, and uh, Ms. Huskins had disappeared again, which is, uh, and they hadn't spoken to her. Um, and then said the whole thing was a, a wild goose chase, and that we owed the city an apology and for instilling fear onto the community and the real victims. Um, and then it turns this whole frenzy of no longer a missing woman is now a hoax, and that became a firestorm of the media, and then Denise was being called the real life gone girl. Uh, and our, uh, our lives, our reputations were just destroyed in an instant. Um, our work tried to fire us. Uh, people, you know, our close family and friends knew that it actually happened, but other people didn't. Um, Denise got a ton of hate mail, like more or less death threats. Uh, people telling us we should be ashamed of um, how dare we do this to our family? How dare we do this to real victims? And uh, if we didn't have each other, I don't, I don't know where we would be. Um, yeah. and if, unfortunately, just, uh, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot to our story. So to, yeah. I'll give you the <laughs> speed so. through. Why it's, we uh, wrote a book. Yeah, we do want yeah, to the, uh, Fortunately, a few months, not, fortunately, the police from different department did their job. Unfortunately, a few months later, one of the perpetrators attacked another family in a similar style. But, those detectives actually believed the couple. Um, and the uh, detective ended up tracing that phone call, or tracing his, he let, the perpetrator left his phone at the crime scene. She followed that back up to South Lake Tahoe and then found evidence that linked them to our, to our crime. And uh, in turn, the, then the FBI finally uh, arrested him and we were able to at least get some level of uh, justice and more importantly, get someone, this dangerous man off, off the streets. Um. Yeah. yeah, Misty, the detective um, in, in that case, I mean, she's our hero. Our lives would have been over if she didn't uh, take those extra measures to find out what else he was involved in because very she very easily could have said okay like we got the guy for our case case closed um but she said that when she went into that home she's she knew something else happened there um and so she was relentless and and followed the evidence and it led her to to our case and it was her first case as a detective yeah and yeah. <laughs> She's amazing. As Denise yeah. was saying, she's our hero. Her husband's amazing as well. They actually came to our wedding. Um, yeah. They came and, to our baby shower. And we went to hers. We went to so. their baby shower. Uh, and and so. for us, too, I mean, all we wanted that whole time was to have a hero, especially in law enforcement, to turn to. Um, and it was just like this just horrible uh, twilight zone of like, you know, like Aaron said, we grow up believing in the police and you call them, something bad happens, you call 911 and now we're like, do you? And if you do, should you also get your defense attorney on the phone too? Yes. And that is gonna be our new reality. I mean, that's something, you know, so it's just, it's really disheartening in a lot of ways, but at the same time, there's, there's detectives like Misty and then Aaron's brother is an FBI agent. I mean, the fact that we had him to consult with and talk to, and help us through each of these legal battles and obstacles. Um, you know, not many other people who are were in our position um, had that advantage. Yeah. And you spent what, one hundred and forty thousand dollars on legal fees to, right, to defend yourself? 100, yeah, 100, about one hundred forty thousand dollars on 
And even but, then, our attorneys worked way beyond. And we, that. we never got charged. So we, there's not many, it tells you how there's a problem if you, how many people have 140,000 to spend. Um, right. I mean, we, and he had sold, yeah, he sold his house. And his parents, they're not wealthy, but they had always lived very frugally, and so they had money saved, yeah. but, but um, and they had to do it. But, because uh, otherwise, I mean, you don't know. I mean, if they hadn't had such good lawyers, they could, they could have been arrested. For the three months before one of, their, one of their perpetrators was caught, the only people being investigated were Aaron and Denise. And they kept making it very clear to them, the U.S. Attorney's Office and everything, that they were being investigated and they were going to be charged. Meantime, this gets convoluted, but the, the FBI agent on the case used to date Aaron's ex fiance he did not disclose that. Um, he should have recused himself. He did not do that. They kept him away from Aaron and all these meetings he was having, and then they find out. He, but he questioned Denise. Yeah, so um, I still went in for questioning for two days, and she didn't on know who he was. second day, he was the one that questioned me, and then by the end of it, he told my attorney, 99% um, sure she's lying, and uh, you should watch Gone Girl. Again, it'll explain a lot, and this is the same agent who has a severe conflict of interest. Um, yeah, I mean it. He actually, that same agent, uh, well, David Sesma, I might as well say his name. Uh, yeah, we can say his name. He, uh, he actually at one point accused my brother of being a co-conspirator, that my brother was helping me cover up this murder. Uh, again, never disclosed his relationship. Uh, and not only was it he had dated my ex, he actually she was previously married, and their relationship ended her first her marriage. So it was an affair as well. Um, but he got promoted. And <laughs> Detective, oh, Mustard Detective Mustard got yeah. officer of the year that same year. That year. He's a head of the police. That same year. He's a head of the police union, and they want to make him feel better. Uh, but they were able to file a lawsuit against the police yeah. for defamation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of tragic um, events that happened um, in our case and that we detail in the book, but it is ultimately our love story, and it is there is a happy ending. We were able to stay together, and our bond grew stronger because of it and because of our families, um, and we got married in 2018, and now we have a one-year-old who is just, like, she's just a bright light. Um, she was born five years to the day that I was released from the kidnapping. Um, and I always considered that release like my second chance at life, my rebirth. And so then having her come into this world the same day is just, I mean, ironic and beautiful at the same time. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's obviously a lot that even though this has been in and out of the, the media cycle for the last six years, there's a lot that hasn't been talked about and hasn't been covered. Um, and a big part of our trauma was that misrepresentation and that, you know, the labeling um, and then the social media attacks um, and in a lot of ways that was more traumatic than the actual crime. Um, and so that's why it was so important for us to write a book, to be able to share the truth of the world finally, um, and in sharing, to be able to shed light on some really serious social and systemic issues that we faced, um, but maybe more than anything to help support other survivors, because for us, when we had to stay silent for those years, um, we watched a lot of other survivors speak out, and it just empowered us. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we can do the same. But we'd like to open it up if you guys have questions. Um, there, I'm told there are microphones. I'm having a hard time seeing. Uh, if you want to come up, there's a microphone there. Oh, there's one. Okay, hi. What's your hi. question? First, thank you so much for sharing your story. I can't imagine sitting up here and talking about this and doing it over and over again. Thank you. While you're going through this crazy upside down world, did either of you ever think like, did he do this to me? Did you ever think like, am I being played? Is this something that she's set up somehow? Did you ever think like, 
do I not know him at all? At all? Did he set this up against me? I mean, while you're in that situation, because the world obviously was crazy and upside down. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's. You, I mean, you you have to go through all possibilities, right? So, you, I mean, when I was released and then the immunity offer was being given to me, I spoke to a different defense attorney at first. He was more in Southern California, and then I got, and he was like, well, how do you know this guy's not gonna take it? Like, how well do you really know him? And I'm like, I know him though. Like, I, and, but you cycle through it, like, one, it, did I have a psychotic break? And am I, like, do I, am I schizophrenic? Like, you, I mean, you can't, have, you have to question your own sanity and think, no, but how did I get down here? Like, how physically could I have gotten down here if this didn't really happen? And then two with him, I'm like, there's a possibility he could take the immunity, but why would he do that? This happened. Like, he was there, like, so it didn't, it didn't make sense, but certainly, yeah, I mean, I know Aaron had that. Yeah, in the press conference, um, I think when, if you guys see it, um, the police officer is, uh, Kenny Parkett, he's mad, and he is convinced, and he's convincing in it. Um, and when he said, you know, did he stop communicating, um, it did plant like a, a seed of doubt in me. And uh, it's probably my, one of my biggest regrets in my life. Um, and then, you know, at that point, um, as you say, like, the world's so upside down. Um, and then I realized, I, you know, took a few minutes and realized like how they treated me. And, and thankfully, Denise was smart enough and uh, to get an attorney. And I realized they're just they're just making it up. Um, and my attorney went, well, if they're offering if they're offering you both immunity uh, and only giving it to one, that means they need the other one to to uh, say it's a hoax, and like, that means they don't have shit. <laughs> <laughs> Our defense attorneys were amazing. Yeah. Like, if you have any like reservations about attorneys, I mean, they were, they really were our yeah, heroes, you know. They came to our wedding as well. Yeah. 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 We had, we had like two 20, tables we had about full 20 of attorneys our attorneys. <laughs> Civil attorneys, our criminal attorneys, yeah. yeah. Denise's attorney actually married them. Oh, yes, yeah, he was married at her wedding. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're going to be lifelong it's friends. Different, different world now. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question over here? I do. Hi. You said a number of people came into the home, to your home. Do you, do you, can you tell us how many people in, came in? Have they all been arrested? Were any of police, were any of them ex-military? Uh, yes. Uh, one, one has been arrested. He's ex-military. He's, he's a Harvard-trained lawyer. Uh, his name is Matthew Muller. He was 38 at the time. Uh, the police are claiming that he did it by himself. He is, he's saying that he did it um, by himself, but he's also attempting to use um, um, insanity as his defense. So you can't have co-conspirators if you have. Uh, can't be insane and have and, plotted and planned something like this for six months with people. Yeah, so we know there's three people, at least three people in the home, based off of Denise saw. Uh, people from a couple of people from waist down. We heard why the voice was next to us. We heard two different distinct sounds downstairs with people, one person using drill, the other person going through the cabinet. Um, so there's at least three, um, but we, we doubt that they'll look for the other two because it's the same investigators who said, I murdered Denise, and that was a hoax. And we, asked, uh, we asked for new investigators, they didn't give it to us, and that special agent. Uh, who had an affair is the one claiming that everything is okay and they caught the bad guy. And uh, we, the one thing we did skip over is, so uh, the morning after this press conference, so the Burke Hall Gone oh, yeah. Girl, headlines all over the world, the kidnappers sent a 9,000 word email to the media, to the San Francisco Chronicle saying, hey, you know, we did this, this wasn't, they did not make this up, it's not a hoax. And, it's a, and it gives all these details, it has pictures of where Denise was held, all these details were, were an Ocean's Gentleman um, League, League oh. were an Ocean's Eleven group of gentlemen criminals, and they give all these details about the crimes they've committed on the island, and then the police are just like, they figured they wrote the emails and scheduled them, and then they accused their attorneys of writing them. But so even in this email, they're saying how their group worked, and it wasn't enough. So we know there's more people out there, but they're, ga they're being gaslit yet again, because yeah. I think the FBI doesn't want to investigate because it's going to lead back to their own house in some way. There's no other explanation. 
Um, but I'm sorry. Oh, over here. Oh, oh, over here. I'm sorry. She yeah. Yeah. So that actually, what you just said, kind of leads into my question. Um, was you mentioned about they had mentioned about the ex-fiance and that you were mistaken for that. So has she been questioned? Is there any information she has given? And my other question would be, did they ever find any information on who what he, the guy mentioned to you on of who was planning this, who was paying them, or who was behind this? Has any information come out about that? And the investigators basically say that he did it by himself because he's like a, a sexual deviant. Um, he had broken into homes uh, eight years prior and threatened to rape the female victim, um, but never followed through. Um, yeah, so it's difficult because being position of victims, we don't have the power to investigate. You know, we can only tell them so much and push them in the right direction, and then, I mean, it's out of our hands. So it's it's hard in that way. I don't think. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get a lot of answers. Um, and for us, like part of writing the book too is that um, many victims, things happen, they never get answers. Uh, and so we have to move forward in the unknown. And um, we're hoping as people read, read through, um, maybe they see that. But I obviously we would love to find the answers of what happened, but what's more important is like our love for each other, our families, um, you know, we're back working, um, those core things that, that mean more than uh, if yeah. something else affects. I mean, the only downside yeah, I mean, that is that we know there's other people out there who are dangerous. Um, yeah, we, I mean, but, obviously we wish we knew, but if you keep asking why, you'll drive yourself crazy, yeah, so be, at some point, we have to move forward. And Moeller said, though, um, the, the lone person who's been arrested, and he was he pled guilty to kidnapping in the federal trial, still facing a state trial on the kidnap and the rape and home invasion charges. But he said in a, one of his court filings that he plays this cat and mouse game a lot. That he speculated that it was the ex, the cop that his ex fiance was having the affair with, that she, he was behind this home invasion to try to send him back her back into his arms because they had broken up again, her and the sex. I mean, it's very convoluted, but, you know, it seems to be that there's some connection to law enforcement. It does make sense that this ex-cop who was having the affair with his ex-fiance, who was the target, you know, may have been the one who hired these guys to send him rushing, her rushing back to his arms. And she's married to him today and has a baby with him. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, over here? Um, yes, I think you've probably already answered this question, but I wondered if anybody in law enforcement had ever officially apologized to you for any of that. Can you the, put the, the, I'm sorry, did anybody in law enforcement ever officially apologize to you for doubting you and accusing you? Uh, uh, their city attorneys wrote an apology letter for them and they signed it. That was, that was yeah. lovely. <laughs> they, there's a new police chief, and with us promoting the book, this new police chief did give us a public apology and saying that what happened to us was wrong. Um, it's just interesting because we reached out, Nikki reached out um, for comment for our book and they didn't say anything. But when we're promoting our book and it's on 2020 and People <laughs> magazine, then, then they're apologizing. So it's a little, would, you know. I would say, uh, I did get to speak to one other FBI agent, uh, Agent Walter, and um, he actually did genuinely apologize. And he apologized to me, apologized yeah. to my, my my mom, and apologized to Denise. And that yeah. uh, he's the only one in law enforcement, and that was uh, sincere. Yeah, genuine. Uh, and owned up his mistakes, and that uh, yeah, that was that was at least satisfying, at least individually. But yeah. as a whole, it's been all PR. Apologies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Over here. Uh, good morning. Um, so, kind of story into a question, but there was a gentleman named Alan uh, Krotzer who was cleared by the Innocence Project but served 25 years, uh, received a settlement from the police. But after he was released, he was um, frequently harassed and brought up on minor charges. And it seems like even though the police will. Um, clear you or they'll, they'll never like believe you so I guess my question is 
have you faced any sort of harassment from law enforcement uh, post, or uh, not post because it's still going? Uh, we, no. Uh, we haven't received anything directly. One of, we did move. Yeah, we moved out. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It was definitely, a, a, and again, we are fortunate that we can move out, and a lot of people can't move from their communities, and that does happen, that harassment. Um, and yeah, but we've, uh, we feel safe in the community that we're in, and again, like we have our criminal attorneys that we can always call, and if anything came up. Um, and we, as much as publicity was um, a huge part of our trauma, it's like because it's in the public eye in some ways, it's ironically safe in that way, if anything happened to us. We have a platform, which again, a lot of people don't have, so. And I'm sorry, we've got to wrap this up. They're gonna bring the hook yeah. out. Is um, there one, <laughs> can we make uh, One more, no? just right here, sorry. Is that you? Hear me? Yes. Are you aware that in the state of Illinois, legislation has been passed yes. to keep interrogators from lying to juveniles, to trick them into confessions and to exhaust them? Would you like to see that kind of legislation pass in the United States? Yeah, so Illinois passed a really big step of reducing deceptive techniques to juveniles. I, New York and Oregon are looking to do uh, similar bills. Hope, I'm hoping um, to become an advocate for that to be passed in all 50 states, and not just for juveniles, but for adults. Uh, yeah. the, the ability of, for police to lie doesn't help anyone, mm -hmm. uh, and they always do the ends justify the means, but particularly in our case, if they weren't able to lie to me, to my brother, to Denise's family, to my parents, uh, they would actually just have to look at the evidence. And if I had committed a crime, you present me with evidence, it's very difficult to get out of that. Um, in turn, they use these deceptive t techniques because confessions get convictions. Uh, and we need as a society to adjust from that. Uh, you are innocent until proven guilty. Um, and I, yes, I, to wrap it up, I would love for it to happen yeah. all across this country. We deserve better, and I know police will do better if they just eliminate that choice for them. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.